Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM. Thanks for coming. If this is your first time, we have the world's leading thinkers when it comes to the future and where we're headed. Today, we've got one of them, Jacob Morgan. Thanks for coming today, Jacob. Thanks for having me. So Jacob, I, I got your wife on the program recently, and that was a complete coincidence. What's it like working with, what's it like being a power couple? Oh man, uh, <laughs> a power couple. She's all the power. Um, it's it's fun. I mean, we share a home office together, so we sit side by side. She's actually downstairs on phone calls right now. Uh, so we spend a lot of time together. And whenever people hear that, they always say, oh, man, I could never be with my my spouse as, as, as much as you are. But we we like it. We help each other out. We support each other. So uh, for us, it works. But it's definitely not something that I think a lot of people would handle um, as far as spending that much time with somebody. Well, it's great. If you haven't killed each other yet, it means it's a good marriage and it'll last. It's true. Everyone is still alive. Everyone's breathing. Uh, so it's it's been it's been good so far. That's what counts. I wanted to get you on because you've looked quite a bit into the future of work. I know you've got a story and some background, but first let's get into the the five trends. I know I know you've kind of defined where you see us headed. Yeah, so I talk, uh, this was in my previous book that came out in 2014. I talked about five trends that are shaping the future of work, which I realized some of those trends could have actually even been combined. Uh, I talked about changing demographics, so new generations entering the workforce, we're working longer, we're retiring later, so that's been a huge trend. Uh, mobility as far as our access to, to mobile phones, technology, the web, that's been a growing trend. We still have a lot of people who are even coming online now and getting access to mobile devices around the world. So when we get to a point where, you know, 80, 90% of the population is mobile and online, it's going to be a pretty different world that we're living in. So that's, that's a huge trend. I also talk about technology, just AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, internet of things, just all these different types of technologies that are coming our way. Uh, that's also going to be driving a lot of change. And then the last two trends I talk about in the book um, are new behaviors. So just different ways that we act, different things that we value, uh, things that we care about. I think that's been a pretty interesting trend to see over the years. And the very last one is globalization. Uh, globalization, not just in terms of uh, commerce, but in terms of ideas and, and how we work. And basically, the, the barriers to doing any kind of business, I feel like crumbling, uh, they are crumbling and deteriorating. So, you know, the language that you speak and the currency that you transact in, where you're located, all these things are starting to matter much less. Yeah, we're having this phone call now. Okay. It's crazy when yeah, you, there you, go. you look at these trends, and these trends apply across just about everything. How do yeah. you think about that? Uh, I think they do apply across pretty much everything. You know, I, I have a podcast that I host, and I interview executives on the podcast all the time. And the, whether they're in fashion or in pharma or in finance or construction, technology, they always talk about these trends as well. So I think it's and then these are global guests from different parts of the world. So I think these these trends are being felt by everyone, every company, uh, every industry, every geography. What keeps these guys up at night? Man, that's I don't know what keep, it, it depends who you talk to. I suppose everyone has different things they keep up uh, that keep them up at night. Probably the most common one is um, just being to, able to adapt to the pace of change. Right, things are changing so quickly, so frequently. Uh, it seems like one of the big stressors for a lot of executives is how do you just keep up, make sure that you don't become obsolete and outdated? And that's where you come in, right? Well, <laughs> that would be nice. Um, yeah, you know, I I don't know if there's a perfect answer for that. I don't think you can ever be kind of right at the fringe or right current with uh, with the changes that we're starting to see, but you can at least be pretty close by. So, I mean, I view myself as educator, right? I, I like to teach people. I like to engage them, motivate them, inspire them to make changes uh, in their organizations or in their careers. And I have a lot of fun with it. So hopefully that is uh, where I come in. And you see a lot of companies as they get big, they start out as startups, they're lean, they're scrappy, they're innovative. And as they get bigger and larger, a lot of that starts to go away and you start to see them becoming taken over by processes, by systems. How do you see the future of innovation? Well, so I should point out that it's not for all, uh, all organizations. There are some larger organizations that actually do a pretty good job of still operating like smaller companies. So I think Microsoft does a good job. I think Cisco does a good job of this. 
Uh, but the the stereotype is that, yeah, the bigger the company, the more rules and policies and bureaucracy you have. And the smaller the company, the more nimble you should be able to be. But there are pros and cons, right? Because if you're smaller, you typically have less uh, or fewer resources, and you're sometimes not able to execute on uh, on some things. If you're bigger, more resources, unlimited funding, but again, you have to deal with maybe the slower pace of change. So I think innovation in the future is um, opening up, right? It's not just about a couple of people sitting in a basement in an R&D room. You innovate with customers, partners, suppliers, uh, competitors, the general public with employees. Innovation comes from anywhere and everywhere instead of just kind of a pre-assigned group. Does it scare you that in the past monopolies would be broken up because they couldn't keep up, but today Google and Facebook just buy the competitors before they can even compete? Um, yeah, I mean, that is, um, so there's an episode, I think it was not Black Mirror, it was um, the Philip Dick when Android's Dream of Sheep, I think is the show uh, on uh, Amazon Prime. And there was an episode there, <clears throat> uh, I can't remember the name of the episode, Um so oh, it was called auto auto vac or auto fac or something. And it basically took this idea of what happens when an organization like an Amazon, it was eerily similar to Amazon takes over the world where they literally produce and manufacture everything, including people, right? Including actual humans, androids that it creates. And it's just a really cool kind of, you gotta be into science fiction and that kind of stuff, of course, but it's just a really cool concept of what might happen when an organization like that becomes too big, where it kind of takes over. And I think that is of course a potential, um, I don't want to say a threat, but a potential thing that we need to pay attention of because I don't think there is any organization out there that touches as many people as a Facebook or as a Google, for example. And so they, those types of companies have a lot of power. They also have a lot of responsibility. And as we've seen recently, they also make a ton of mistakes. So I'm not sure what the future of those organizations is going to look like, um, or if we're going to have more government inter intervention or, or breaking things up. But it certainly seems like those are potential uh, scenarios that, that might become more real. Speaking of breaking things up, this has been a thought that I've had. What if companies and governments had a life cycle? They could only be around for so long before they had to restart. You could become innovative again. How would you do that? I have no clue. Uh, so if governments could only be around for a certain time and then they would disappear. Um, I don't know. I, I'm trying to imagine how... Um, how that would work or if there have been any kind of examples. I, I mean, in this, in some ways, whenever you get a new elected official, uh, you know, a new president, a new prime minister, that kind of does happen. You know, some of the old policies and things come with that elected official, but oftentimes the new person that gets elected has their own agenda, their own priorities, their own things that they want to do, but it's not kind of starting from, from scratch where everything gets abolished. Uh, but in some ways, I think we do have a little bit of a life cycle going on there, probably just not to the extreme that that you might be thinking of. But it's more starting at like 97%. Yeah, it is more starting like 90, 97%. Um, and I think that's kind of the the standard. I, I mean, you know, that's going to be the way things are, at least for the foreseeable future, unless something totally drastic and insane happens. Uh, so if you're a fan of uh, the science fiction stuff, you know, the purge, the movie, the purge, that's like a complete radical idea of a, of a new type of government, a new type of policy, more anarchy and kind of chaos. And so uh, who knows, maybe if something really drastic and insane happens in the world, we'll see kind of a reboot and a refresh. You see it sometimes with corporations where they realize they're too slow and stupid to keep up. So they'll send some of their best people off site to do an offsite, let's create something to completely change the organization. And it works when they implement it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, um, I, I don't necessarily think they reboot the entire company, but it's for maybe new products, new divisions, or maybe if it's a smaller organization, uh, you know, Google has done this. A lot of companies that have innovation programs or hackathons typically do this, where they try to break down specific practices inside the organization and then rebuild them and try to do something new. So I think we're definitely seeing more of those types of things happen, which uh, which I think is fun and exciting. So you brought up two different sci-fi books already. What I, I feel like you're a sci-fi guy. I do. I, uh, I or I am, I should say. I, I, I love science fiction. I 
Uh, I love I love uh, Isaac Asimov. I love the Foundation series. I love Ender's Game. Um, so huge fan of science fiction. I, I think it's it's pretty cool and fascinating. How does it help you think bigger and outside the box? Well, I mean, one of the things I like about science fiction is that it it takes a lot of ideas and theories that people have and it makes it a little bit more real. So it's one thing to think about, hey, what might happen if a company like Amazon takes over the world? But if you can actually watch a show about it, it brings it's it's more real because you actually see it, you can visualize it, you can maybe feel it a little bit more. So I think science fiction takes a lot of what people are thinking about and wondering about and makes it um, more real. It actually creates that story and paints that picture. And um, it helps conceptualize things in a more real way. So that's why I love it, because I think it just gets you to think big picture, what's possible, what might happen. And I think that's a lot of fun. It usually gives you a negative side of what things are going to look like, though, especially with automation and AI. It's more exciting to see the dystopias. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of dystopian films out there. In fact, I'm trying to think of if there has been a recent science fiction film or story that had more of like that positive, um, you know, sometimes the outcomes can be positive, but as far as the worlds in which these things are set, it's usually not positive. like Blade Runner, right? I mean, might have a positive outcome, but the world in which it's set is very yeah. dystopian. Yeah. Same thing for Ready Player One. Positive outcome, very dystopian world. So I can't think of any like, happy utopian science fiction worlds. Although I know they're out there. I feel like I've seen them. I just can't remember. We had somebody on the podcast before and he was saying they did a survey to see which utopian future people would like the most. They came up with a bunch of different possible outcomes, basically based off of stories, ideas, etc. And universally, people selected none of them. They selected their life because the utopia didn't sound appealing. Is there, is there something hardwired in us to need this struggle? Um, no, I, I mean, I suppose it depends on what you do fi define as utopia. So for me, I live in my own little utopia, right? I mean, I, I get to do the things that I love. I like the journey of building something, of creating something, of impacting things. So for me, that's utopia, right? For me, sitting on a beach, just having money, like not doing anything, that doesn't, that's not utopia for me. That sounds a little bit like boredom. Uh, so I suppose it depends on how you define utopia and the type of people that you talk to. I view it more as a journey instead of a struggle. So struggle, of course, implies negative, you know, bad situation. But I think the journey is fun, right? The the grind is fun. The building, the creating something is fun. And you feel a sense of pride and accomplishment. So I personally uh, very much enjoy that. And who knows, maybe the people that were surveyed in that enjoy that too. Yeah, I guess it depends if it's a personal thing or a societal thing. When it's societal, it feels forced. Yeah, exactly. Do you have headphones, by the way? It's making a little noise in the background. Um, I do not have headphones near me, no. I don't hear anything, actually. You don't? My audio is coming back. Just turn it down just a little bit then. Sorry about that. No, it's all good. I turned my computer mic down. Okay, we'll see how that works. So... In terms of the future, the future of work, what does it look like? Because people speculate about this all the time. Man, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, and it depends on how far out in the future you want to look, right? There's always going to be a future of whatever. Uh, there's a future of work tomorrow. There's a future of work in six months, in five years, in 100 years. So there's always going to be some sort of a, a future of work. Uh, for me, instead of trying to define what it looks like, I think the bigger thing that we need to focus on is how do we build whatever it is that we want to see. Uh, because usually when we say what is the future of work, we we make a couple assumptions on there, which I think are, are wrong. The first thing that we assume is that there's just one future, right? What is the one future of work that we're going to see? Uh, and the second assumption that we make is that the future is not something that we can control. It's just something that's going to happen to us. And what do we do when it, when it gets here? And so I think it's important to kind of flip that around uh, and instead think about uh, what are the many potential futures that might happen? Uh, maybe we'll see a lot of AI and automation. Maybe it'll look a lot the way it does now. Maybe we'll see a balance between technology and automation. Maybe we'll see massive chaos. Uh, depending on 
the part of the world that you look at, you'll probably see a combination of all these different things happen. Maybe automation in some industries, but nothing changes in other industries. Maybe some parts of the world have a lot of automation, other parts of the world don't. So I don't think it's as black and white as some people try to make it sound. I think it's constantly uh, going to be very dynamic. Uh, and the second thing, or the second part of that is, we don't spend enough time trying to think about the future that we that we want to see happen, right? We ask, what is the future of work? But how come we don't ask, um, what's the future of work we want to see? And how do we build that future of work? So for me, I want to see a future where we have a lot of new opportunities that are created, where technology helps us remove the mundane, boring tasks from our lives, where, where we create organizations that are more human, where people enjoy showing up to work, where we see um, kind of a higher engagement levels, more of that sense of purpose and an engagement and meaning in our lives. I mean, that, that for me is the future of work that I want to see happen. And that is the one that I'm trying to build through the uh, speeches that I give, the courses that I create, the books that I write. And so I want to encourage people watching and listening to think about it from that perspective as well. What do you want to see the future of work look like and what are you doing to help build it? I think a lot of people would think like that, but they also feel helpless as if it's a, a tide you can't quite stop. Like technology moves on once it's here, you usually don't go back. Yeah, I mean, I totally get it. Um, but that's not the right way to think. Um, if you just view yourself as a power, kind of like a leaf blowing in the wind, that's a very surefire way to, uh, to make sure that you will get automated and replaced. Um, everyone has to take accountability, right? I mean, you can learn whatever you need to learn to be successful and relevant in the future. Uh, so there's no reason to feel helpless. The technology changes, but technology is a tool. And if you assume that the tool itself is going to take over the world, then I hate to say it, but you're kind of the tool. <laughs> so don't, don't think about it like that as far as I'm helpless and powerless. Instead, think about it as, um, uh, you know, I got to be more accountable and responsible, uh, you know, there's uh, in, in a lot of the talks that I give, I always like to give the um, uh, the quote uh, with a great uh, power comes great responsibility. You know, you, I think it was in the Spider-Man movie, but the quote comes uh, much earlier on than that. And I like to flip it around and I say with great accountability and responsibility comes great power. So if you are willing to be more accountable and responsible over your career, your skills, what the future is going to look like, how to build it, you will have much more power instead of just kind of sitting there and just waiting. How do you think about UBI or potential socialism? Do you think we're going to need to change what we're doing mm -hmm. today? Uh, I know there are a couple experiments that are going on for universal basic income. I think it's an interesting idea, but it's one potential idea. And it by itself is not going to solve anything. It's not as if you can leave everything the way it is, just give people a little bit of extra money every month, and then think that the world will be a better place. I think lots of things need to change. The way that we uh, teach um, and educate kids and, and people in college, elementary school, middle school, uh, the accountability that individuals need to have over their careers, the accountability that organizations have for training and reskilling. And sure, maybe universal basic income can be another kind of ingredient that goes in there. But again, it's an ingredient. You're, you're not going to make um, a, a delicious stew or soup just with chicken broth, right? The universal basic income is the pepper or the salt or the broth. But there are a lot of other things that you got to throw in there to make that thing taste good. And uh, I think for us, just relying on universal basic income as a, as a silver bullet is just not going to happen. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible idea just to rely on something, especially something. Yeah, of course. I mean, you can't just have that one thing in there and just assume that everything will be fine. Not realistic. Yeah. So in terms of travel, I know you're a big traveler. What countries do you see doing the best job or the most positioned to be successful in the future in terms of what the future potentially looks like most likely in your scenario? Oh my goodness. Uh, it depends. I think there are different organizations all over the world who are doing interesting things. Um, you know, I travel quite a bit and, um, uh, you know, whether you go to China, Japan, India, Australia, anywhere in Europe, there are always organizations there that are doing pretty cool and interesting stuff. So it's kind of hard to generalize as far as a region goes or a country goes, you know, China is going perhaps farther ahead with the whole AI thing than anybody else. 
Uh, we see all sorts of things that they're experimenting as far as surveillance and using technology to identify people that are just walking down the street. And, uh, you know, they're going kind of all in with this stuff. But that's also not kind of an ideal future that a lot of people want to live in. So from an AI technology perspective, I think China is just going to be doing some crazy stuff over the next coming years. Uh, but again, I don't know if that's a world that a lot of people want to live in. When you look at kind of corporate culture and workspace design, you know, the UK is doing interesting stuff in Europe. Uh, we're doing interesting things here uh, in the United States. So it's hard to say. Uh, a lot of the first world countries, are, I think, are, are definitely positioned well. But a lot of third world countries are very much um, trying to kind of leapfrog uh, and move ahead quite quickly. So it'll be interesting to say uh, or interesting to see. I, I'm not sure uh, which particular countries might be kind of leading the future of work. I think every country has potential because uh, there are companies in all those countries that are doing cool stuff. What would you say is the over under for when China starts to look a bit like Minority Report? Um, well, if you go by the the things that they've been sharing as far as the articles that are out there, I mean, I think they talked about, I think they said by 2020, they want to roll out this crazy surveillance program in full, full steam, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I think they said by 2020. So, I mean, we're talking right around the corner before you see all of this stuff happening for China. Uh, and we'll see what happens, uh, how it gets received, if other countries want to adopt it, if China productizes it and sells it to others. I mean, you you don't know. We live in a pretty crazy time now, so it'll be uh, interesting to see. Yeah, and it's also the public perception versus the actual government wants. Government wants to know what people are doing, regardless of what they want to appear. Of course. To. Yeah. So it's a, it's a complicated scenario. What technology has you most worried? Um, well, I suppose it would be the same that has a lot of other people worried. You think about the artificial intelligence stuff. I wouldn't say worried, though. <clears throat> I don't think I'm necessarily worried about a particular technology. It's more worried about how the people use those technologies. Uh, technology itself is just a technology, right? It's a hammer. It's nails. It's a screwdriver. Uh, it's more how the people are going to use that technology. So again, looking at China, AI is a super cool technology. It's fascinating. Uh, so is facial recognition and all that other sort of stuff. Um, so as a technology, it's pretty cool. But when you get people who are saying, hey, you know what? We're going to use this to identify everybody at every corner all the time while they're walking around. And we're going to know everything about everybody uh, you know, in, in, the, in the country or in the region. Then you're kind of like, all right, that's kind of freaking scary. So you uh, you start to worry a little bit. So I'm not necessarily worried about the technology as much as I'm worried about how the people are going to use those technologies. How does that level of scary compare to the Facebook Google level of scary? Um, with the NSA? Yeah, it's similar, right? I mean, Facebook Google level of scary is uh, you you start to think about how they're manipulating people without people knowing that they're being manipulated. So it's more of like a subtle brainwashing over a longer period of time uh, that people might not be aware of or familiar with. Whereas kind of the, uh, the other level of scary is it's blatant. It's out there in the open. Everybody knows that it's happening and they can't do anything to stop it. So two different levels of scary. Both, I think, are equally impactful. Uh, but I think one is... You know, if a government decides to do something, there's very little control, obviously, you have over that. If a company decides to do something, you as an individual have a little bit more control over that. So we saw people deleting their Facebook accounts. We saw people, um, you know, stop using certain technologies and migrate to others. So I think as individuals, it also means we need to be more responsible and accountable over the stuff that we consume. You know, don't go. I don't go to Facebook thinking that I'm going to get news. I just don't. I, I go to Facebook thinking that I'm going to like uh, see what some of my friends are doing, maybe post something on my business work page, but it is a social network. It's not, I don't view it as a news source. So if I want to get news, I mean, you, you talk to people, you talk to your friends, you talk to your neighbors, you can look at reputable news sources that are out there and you try to get more of a, of a broader perspective. But if you consume and believe everything that you hear and see just from one particular channel, it's kind of your fault. I hate to say it. It is, but people eat at McDonald's. They do. 
they do eat at McDonald's. And guess what? I don't always blame McDonald's. Sometimes it's the individual. Uh, I, you know, we all make choices in our lives and, uh, I don't believe that at least for me, I don't think that, um, or I try not to think that I have no power over myself. So make the decisions, make the commitment, be accountable, be responsible for it. So we talked about the dystopia. What about the, the better side? What technologies most excite you? All the technologies are exciting, whether you look at AI, augmented and virtual reality, the Internet of Things, blockchain. I mean, they're all pretty cool things. Uh, I don't think there's any technology out there that I'm thinking of that I'm like, ah, that's boring. That's lame. Uh, they're all pretty cool technologies that I think will um, all be used in pretty interesting and creative ways. Anything blow your mind lately? Um, I can't say blow my mind. To, to me, when I think blow my mind, I think of like learning about something that I've never heard of before. I mean, there have been some interesting stories. So I was talking to, um, was it Walmart? Uh, I think it was Walmart, some executives from Walmart. And they use, for example, virtual reality as a way to teach their employees empathy, which I thought was pretty cool because you go in this virtual world, you can see emotion, you can see how people might react. So they teach uh, empathy through virtual reality, which I thought was pretty neat. Uh, they also use uh, blockchain as a way to, they use it for food so that you know where your food comes from, how it was sourced, how it got to, from uh, kind of the starting point to the end point. And they use uh, blockchain as a way to do that because it's sort of this secure ledger that you know nobody tampered with. So I thought those were pretty cool examples of how a company might be using technology in different areas, one for empathy, one for food. Uh, but there are lots of those types of stories and examples that are out there that I think are pretty neat. So you brought up VR and you brought up Ready Player One earlier. Yes. Any ideas how long until we have people that are quite literally working in VR and that's how they earn their income? Any thoughts? Uh, like full-time working in VR? It can um, be part-time as well. It can be gigs. Yeah. So um, you mean as far as like a knowledge worker who does their work in a virtual reality environment? Yeah, knowledge worker that does their work there. I mean, I think probably the earliest will be a adult industry, but we'll go after that. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm sure there are probably already some folks out there somewhere who spend a lot of their time doing virtual stuff. Um, if anything, the past few years have shown us that the virtual and augmented world are not as close as people think. You know, there have been some tech pundits that have gone out there saying, oh, 2017 and 18 is the world, uh, the virtual world. Everyone's going to be wearing these glasses and buying these virtual uh, headsets and uh, that didn't happen. In fact, we we saw quite the opposite. We saw a lot of pushback. We saw organizations stop relying so much on it. We saw some vendors out there kind of um, uh, get lambasted as far as having technologies that were subpar. So I think we've seen kind of more of a, a, a balancing out, so to speak, of where these technologies are realistically. They're pretty neat. But right now, most of the examples that you see, uh, the business case is very much on the fringes. Uh, the personal use of these things is still kind of like, yeah, you know, maybe it's okay. It's nice here and there. But there's not a lot of like, it's not like individuals out there are super excited about it and are using it everywhere. Same thing for companies. Again, a couple of companies might be testing it out here and there uh, just to see what the potential implications are. But I think we probably have a solid, you know, five years before we start to see more, uh, more of this stuff being taken seriously and implemented um, more larger scale. And then probably another three to five years, if not more beyond that, where we start to see, you know, e even more use and more implementation of it. Uh, so as far as how long before somebody's using virtual reality full time, like let's say you work at IBM and you're a knowledge worker and you're full time in a virtual world. Oh man, I think it's probably farther than it is closer. Um, honestly, I probably think that it's maybe 15, 15 years out, 20 years out, if not further. Um, not just because of the technology, but from an individual perspective as well, right? I mean, you there's still a lot of studies that are being done on how this impacts physical and mental health of just sitting in a virtual world and uh, people are getting dizzy from it. People are getting sick from it. So it, it's not just the technology that needs to be there. It's that kind of human comfort level that needs to be there. Same thing for autonomous vehicles as well. Um, we always assume that just because the technology is ready means it's going to happen. Not the case. So I think as far as implementation and having these things at scale, it's probably farther out than some people think. Do you think autonomous is more the people or more the government and regulations? Probably a little bit of everything. 
Um, you know, I, I certainly think that the technologies themselves for autonomous vehicles are pretty much there. Um, I mean, they've probably been there for a couple of years already. So it's not so much just the technology piece that's there. It's kind of like the rules, the policies, the regulations, the insurance, the human comfort level, the what happens when something goes wrong, uh, the um, you know infrastructure that's required to make a lot of these things work. That is, I think, probably the bigger hurdle than just kind of the technology. But the technology itself, as far as having an autonomous car that can drive and 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 do things well, I think is pretty much there. It's a lot of the other stuff surrounding it that's keeping it from actually being deployed uh, on a massive scale. Would you ride in one with your eyes closed? Um, today? Yeah, today. I suppose it depends where. If it's on like local streets versus a highway. Um, you know, if I'm going 80 miles an hour on like the freeway or the, the, the autobahn versus going 25 miles an hour where, where I live, I'd probably do something a little bit more uh, more local first and a little bit kind of a uh, slower speed. But eventually, sure. I mean, eventually the idea is we're going to get to a point where you're sitting in an autonomous vehicle and you can work, have conference calls, have meetings, do whatever you need to do. And the car will just take you where you need to go. Again, one of the reasons why science fiction is so cool, we saw a lot of this in examples uh, in like iRobot with Tom Cruise. We saw an example of what that might look like. And so uh, we'll eventually, I think we'll get to something similar. You there, Jacob? I'm here. Okay, cut out for a little bit. We've got the audio, so we can splice that back together. No worries. So technology, it's great, and it's great until it's not. What, um, in terms of going forward, uh, this is something I wanted to ask you: the economy. Is it time that we evolve beyond GDP as a driving force for what we're aiming for? It feels like it's a bit outdated these days. Yeah, you know, and I'm not an economist by trade or background, so I'm probably not even the best person to uh, to answer. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it seems like I mean, you have people that have argued for it, you have people that have argued against it. Same thing like anything else in the world, right? For performance reviews against performance reviews, for GDP against GDP. I don't think we're ever going to be happy with whatever metrics we're using. There are always going to be people that say there's something better or something different. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting again to see what, uh, what will happen over the coming years. It will be. It's just problematic. If you have to increase GDP, then you've got to increase consumption always. How do you think yeah. about the gig economy? Uh, oh, the gig economy is something that I know a lot of organizations around the world are paying attention to. I think it's definitely a trend for the future of work to pay attention to. I don't think full-time jobs are going to go away. Uh, I think uh, full-time jobs are here to stay, but the gig economy is a great way to kind of uh, support and have that kind of other layer to it. So for companies, it means being more dynamic, more fluid, uh, but I think the gig economy is certainly growing, but it's not going to overtake full-time employment. Who do you think will be the long tail 20 years from now, large corporations or smaller businesses in terms of who's employing significantly more people? Hard to say. I mean, at the current rate, if you think that companies like Walmart and Amazon and Facebook and Google and these massive behemoths are going to get bigger, then you tend to lean more towards the larger company side. If you think that a lot of these companies are going to get broken up and we'll start to see more um, uncertainty in those areas, then you kind of tend to lean toward the smaller businesses. So it's hard to say as far as what the long tail is going to be. I think it'll be a combination of both. Um, I'm not sure actually what the current data is or the current research as far as who employs more people? Is it larger organizations or is it smaller and medium sized companies? I think it is smaller and medium sized companies versus larger ones from what I recall. Uh, but I don't know how updated that stat is. I think it is as well, but it is also crazy. That, yeah. that, that said, this year, Amazon's hiring 20,000 less seasonal workers for the, I heard. the fourth quarter. Yeah, I heard. So they're hiring fewer workers. And I can't remember how many employees Amazon has in total. It's, a, it's like 300,000. Yeah, they're, they're so massive. They're, they're absolutely massive in terms of size and scale. And they're relying very heavily on technology and automation as well. And, um, you know, they're probably relying 20,000 less on seasonal workers, but they're also creating a ton of new jobs. They're going into new opportunities, new business ventures. They're creating, you know, retail stores, actual bookstores. They're sending people to space. 
Uh, they tried making phones. They're making their own products from Amazon Basics. So they're in manufacturing. I mean, they are literally getting their hand in every possible cookie jar they can think of. Uh, so th that's very much like a Black Mirror episode, right? They deliver food. They bought Whole Foods. It's, you know, you try to imagine Amazon in five and 10 years uh, building houses. I mean, what is Amazon not going to be able to do is the, the crazy thing to think about. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, they're even getting into the healthcare space. So they're everywhere. And they announced they're going to start pharma products and the pharma companies drop off the cliff when it comes to stock market prices. They yeah, buy yeah, I heard. I mean, it's just crash. It's, it's nuts. I mean, it's not. I mean, you basically have a company that has unlimited money, unlimited resources, unlimited time, unlimited energy. Um, and how do you compete with that? So it'll be interesting to see the kind of the monopoly thing. Uh, from what I read around the monopoly debates, usually that comes up when an organization is trying to, you know, they, they take over, but they do so in a way that makes it harder for customers. Like they make things more expensive. They make things harder to get. But in this case, Amazon is actually making things cheaper for people. They're making it easier for people. So the debate there is kind of like, well, it's not really a monopoly because they're actually making it better for customers, not worse. So if it were the other way around and Amazon was acquiring all these companies and making it more expensive and making it harder to get things and trying to focus purely on, uh, you know, jacking up costs, then the monopoly conversation would have already not been a, been a non-starter. But since Amazon is actually doing the opposite, that's where a lot of people get hung up on it. Is it, is it a monopoly or not? It's because the antitrust laws in the U.S. are so outdated. They're based off of the robber barons. Yeah, and friend, that was as things have changed. Yeah, and that's from many, many, many decades ago. So um, those things, if they get updated, you know, Amazon might be in trouble. Yeah, Europe's definitely doing some interesting stuff. How do you see the divergence between the U.S. and Europe, both in terms of society and work? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I know for like labor laws, uh, you know, we have at will employment here in the United States, Europe certainly doesn't. So as far as like how things are structured, I think it's a little bit different. I think from from what I observe, Europe tends to be more of like, uh, you can work here for a longer period, we'll take care of you. It's not at will, you know, we're not just going to fire you, we're interested in having you stay around longer, where it seems like a lot of organizations in the United States have accepted the fact that it's going to be shorter tenure, and they try to figure out how to keep people there longer. So that's been a pretty interesting change to see. Of course, we have differences in kind of healthcare, in uh, we have differences in even like email laws, right? There are a lot of organizations in Europe who are saying that uh, after work hours, we're going to disable email servers. So the European countries, I think, are being very forward thinking and progressive as far as looking at how the world of work is evolving and, and policies and programs that they need to take uh, uh, or implement to, to adapt to those changes. United States, we're we're doing some stuff, but I feel like a lot of what the United States is focused on is less about policies and less about kind of um, those types of formal programs. And it's more around how do we create happy organizations? How do we create more like uh, better places to work? But it's not at like the policy and rule and regulation level. Is uh, it better places to work or better places to live? I know that's what Google wants. Yeah, there. I mean, it depends on the company, right? It's 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 really hard to say. Um, I mean, even if you look at something like physical space, um, I feel like most, if you look at how companies approach physical space in the United States, I feel like we try very hard to be uh, kind of like Pinocchio's Island, uh, super fun, super cool. Whereas if you go to the uh, a lot of European countries, they're kind of more like a museum. Also beautiful places, but it's not about having a slide. It's not about kind of like, you know, fun and games. They're beautiful places, but they have a certain level of like, I don't know, sophistication to them and more um, kind of that museum vibe instead of like the, you know, here's a scooter that you ride through the office and drink beer kind of vibe. Uh, both have their merits and both have their place, but they're just different. And so, um, and again, it's not to say that every company in Europe is like that or every company in the, in the United States is like that, but those are kind of just very broad um, observations. So you're a best-selling author. You run a podcast. You do quite a bit with social media. What's the story? What's your background? How did you get here? Uh, well, bad jobs working for other people. Um, Amen. 
Yeah, I mean, I graduated college and and thought I would go back. Uh, well, I, my first job out of college, um, I graduated with honors in economics and psychology. Very excited to join the corporate world, and I thought that I would, you know, climb climb the corporate ranks, go back and get an MBA, and then go down some kind of marketing path, and maybe one day be a CMO of a company. And uh, first job out of college pretty much sucked. Uh, CEO made me go get him coffee. I was driving three hours a day commuting and I thought, man, this is why I worked so hard in college is to get a CEO coffee and to drive 15 hours a week. There's got to be something better. So I looked for a couple other jobs. I had a couple other jobs. They all pretty much sucked. Uh, and then at that time, um, I was going on Craigslist and uh, looking for uh, gigs that I could do on the side. So consulting around social media or search engine optimization or just anything. And uh, eventually I started to get some clients, get some projects, started making some money on the side. And when I made enough money that I could pay for my expenses, I quit my full-time job. And the rest is history. The rest kind of evolved from that. Topics evolved, the things that I do evolved, the team has grown. So there's, a, I think, around between eight to 10 of us now. So things have changed uh, quite a bit. Again, never planned for any of this to happen, but uh, thankfully, uh, working for bad organizations really helps put me on a different trajectory. So I should be grateful. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great way to look at it. So now, now as an author, how do you use other channels to grow an audience and then essentially promote promote products? It, in the past, you essentially wrote a book, a publisher did everything for you. Today, mm -hmm. it's completely flipped on its head. Yeah, I mean, publishers even today don't do much. Uh, they still rely on you as the author to sell the book. Uh, so a lot of it is relationships. I mean, I try to be everywhere all the time. So I'm on uh, all the major channels posting all the time. Again, I have a team that I work with that helps. I try to create different content. I try to create unique content. Uh, and um, yeah, just everywhere all the time uh, as far as related themes and topics goes. So podcasts, articles, videos, image quotes, uh, live videos. I mean, you name it uh, all over the place, speaking, writing books. You just got to be everywhere all the time. It's a lot of work. Do you think some of it's a bit too much, a bit fluff? For me, podcasts are great. Articles are great. Books are great. Speaking's great. But a lot of the other stuff is just, it's just junk. You don't really want to do it. It's not a high value thing. I thought so too for a while. So for example, when I was doing image quotes, which for people that are not familiar, it's basically a quote and it's maybe a picture of you with a quote of yours over it. And uh, I first started doing these maybe one or two years ago and I'm like, oh man, I'm going to be, I'm going to look like a total jackass. Like who the hell wants to put up a picture of themselves online with a quote behind it? Like that's so lame and so stupid. Uh, but my team convinced me and they're like, you know what, we're just going to do a couple of them and we're going to see how it goes. And so I would put them up online and they actually do very well. I mean, people like the quotes. They like seeing uh, uh, the images, which are in a more fun, non-formal setting. And they like to share them around. It gives them a little bit of motivation and inspiration. And they're fun, right? I try to be creative with them. There are pictures of me doing a handstand, pictures of me like doing all sorts of silly things out there. Uh, in a lot of these pictures, I look damn silly and, and stupid and... Um, like if I personally were to uh, look at those pictures, I'd say I would never want that to go up online. But you just kind of force yourself. Same thing for using video. Um, you know, I years ago, I would say, I don't want to go live. I don't want to do a video. I don't want to put myself out there. I don't like the way I sound on a podcast. You got to get over all that stuff. Um, fluff or not fluff, if you're constantly adding value and you want to be in different places all the time, you got to do it all. Right. The, the, the image quotes, for example, are great for Instagram. We also use them on LinkedIn. Uh, videos go all over the place. When I give a talk somewhere, that gets chopped up into mini clips and get, gets put up in different channels. So it's literally everywhere, all the time, uh, different ways to consume content, uh, whether it's images or podcasts or whatever it is. Uh, so it depends. Right. I mean, some of it, like a, obviously a 60, 70 minute podcast with the, uh, the chief people officer of Walmart is not as serious as, as maybe an image quote of me doing a handstand with, with some kind of like inspirational, motivational quote on there. But it's, uh, you know, 
people will consume it depending on what they're looking for. If they just want something kind of fun, a little quick, uh, you know, fun quote to get them to think differently, image quote is great. If they want to have an hour long conversation about in-depth things around the world of work, the podcast is great. So again, that's why it's important to be everywhere all the time. You seem like a super laid back guy and yet you're also a super high performer. What's the secret? Oh man, I don't know. Um, I'd like to think I'm pretty laid back, but I'm also very, um, I mean, I'm, I'm super competitive. I like the, the journey. I like building. I like creating. I have a lot of online trolls that are out there who are constantly hounding me. So they're a good source of motivation. Um, so I don't know. I, it's just my personality. I like to build. I like to create. I like to do new things. And uh, perhaps more importantly, I love what I'm doing. And so when you love what you're doing, you just want to keep doing it all the time. And that's kind of where I'm at. What's the next new big thing? Uh, so I have a new book that's coming out at the end of next year on the future of leadership. Uh, I have two courses right now. I think a part of the future of work university, the goal is to have uh, 10 by the end of next year. So I'm going to be creating a lot of those products and courses experimenting with doing more like uh, live video, different types of video for the YouTube channel. So always trying things out and seeing what works. So here's the part where we jump into bold predictions. You got anything good 10, 15 years out. What are something you're thinking about that most people are? Oh my goodness. What am I thinking about that most people are not 10, 15 years out? Uh, just about anything? It can be anything. Um, well, it's hard to say if most other people aren't thinking about it. I mean, my hope is that in 10, 15 years, we'll see more people who genuinely like their jobs and actually want to go to work. All right. That would be kind of a cool world to live in uh, where you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, man, I'm excited to go to work. And so uh, I certainly hope we'll see more of that. I think in 10, 15 years, you'll definitely have uh, an AI coworker who is uh, kind of working side by side with you as a, either a coworker or an assistant that's helping you get things done. Um, I think 10, 15 years, we'll certainly see more uh, autonomous vehicles that are out there, hopefully a little bit more at scale. So we'll see more of that stuff happening too. Uh, so it'll be interesting. Uh, technology is definitely going to be taking center stage in, in, in the next 10, 15 years. But I think we're also going to be focusing on creating more human organizations in 10, 15 years. That's probably what I'm more excited about. You think we'll have shorter work weeks? Um, that's hard to say. Uh, you know, people have predicted shorter work weeks for decades. Uh, I think even 30, 40, 50 years ago, people thought by now we would be working 30 or 20 hours a week. Uh, and if anything, we're working more. So I think the, the definition of how long a work week is will become obsolete. I think it'll be more along the lines of uh, just do your job, get things done. It doesn't matter how long you spend on it. So I think uh, the, um, at least for knowledge workers, right, if you're working retail, obviously uh, hours there matter more. But for, for knowledge workers, I think the idea of how many hours you work a week will hopefully become obsolete in the next 10, 15 years. Does that worry you? Because then you're always also on the clock. Yeah. Um, no, it doesn't worry me as much. Uh, I don't think, well, the idea is that you hopefully won't feel like you're always on the clock. So part of it is making sure that you have those conversations, those policies, those rules in place, uh, so that you don't feel like that. But we see that today, right? The shift from work-life balance to work-life integration, people are always connected. They're always kind of uh, available, so to speak. Uh, so I think setting expectations is going to be crucial and making sure we use technology to, um, uh, make sure that we can do that effectively. If you were 18 today, what would you do? Would you go to college? What would you study? What type of jobs would you try to get into? There are a lot of social media pundits that are out there who are saying college is a waste of time, which I think is just stupid advice. Um, it's true that I think the value of college is, is perhaps a little bit diminished and people question the value of college. But if you're a multimillionaire, it's very easy for you to tell others why they shouldn't go to college. But if you work uh, or if you're part of a family household where you're making 40 to 60 grand a year and you want your children to be successful and maybe you don't live in, in, in great parts of the world, college is a way out. And so I think college, you know, it's easy to say that, you know, don't go to college, become an entrepreneur. But by and large, most entrepreneurs fail. I think that's just the reality. Most entrepreneurs out there cannot make a living on their own full time. And so that means that most people in the world end up working at an organization. And most of these organizations around the world require a college degree to be able to get in the door. 
So by not going to college, you immediately cut yourself out from like 80% or 90% of the possibilities that are out there uh, as far as how you can make a living, how you can survive. So I think college is still valuable. It's a great insurance policy, just knowing that you have that college degree um, and that you can apply for jobs and they will consider you. But um, that's kind of the reality of the world, right? I mean, if every company in the world or all the big companies out there said, you know what, we don't care about college degrees anymore, we'll look and interview anybody and we won't place more priority in college degrees. Anybody can apply. Then all of a sudden you're talking about a very different world. But do you think we're going there? <laughs> like with Google and Facebook and a lot of the tech giants, they seem to realize these code courses are just cutting out colleges. Um, well, a lot of them, they haven't necessarily cut out colleges. They stopped looking at top tier universities. So a lot of them are saying, you know what? You don't need to come from a Harvard anymore. You don't need to come from a, a Princeton or a Yale anymore. You can come from any college and we'll look at you. So I think that has changed. Uh, some organizations have done that. Yeah, when it comes to coding, you know, if you've built something great, uh, you've had a business that's been great, sure, they'll take a look at you and they'll consider you. But that is far the minority compared to the majority. The vast majority of people that are applying or working at a company like Google, you can bet have a college degree. Many of them have advanced college degrees. There are not many people working at these companies who are just kind of like, hey, you know what? I went to high school. I decided I don't want to go to college. I applied to Google. I got in because I built a cool website, blah, blah, blah. That does not happen very often. And I think it's actually pretty dangerous uh, for social media pundits to advise and to, and to say that we shouldn't go to college. I mean, I wouldn't want my daughter to hear that. I think that's terrible advice. I don't know. I would push back. I, I think in, I think in 10 or 15 years, college will be a joke. Well, if you look in 10 or 15 years, uh, I don't think it'll be a joke. I don't think colleges are going to go away. And I certainly think in 10, 15 years, a lot of the major companies were still going to require college degrees. And the problem is, let's say you don't go to college and you try to become an entrepreneur. You try to make it out on your own and you fail. Now, all of a sudden, you realize you want to take a, you want to get a job. And most of the people out there are not going to hire you. What are you going to do? Uh, so at least for now, the college degree is a great insurance policy for you to help make sure you can at least get in the door. A lot of companies out there are even using AI. They're using algorithms and bots to scan resumes. And if they don't even see you have a college degree on there, your resume gets deleted. So you don't even have a chance to get an, an interview or a conversation with somebody inside of a company. And so, I mean, that's just the reality of the world that we live in. Uh, all the, I mean, you, you find any job online, it always says requires a degree. I mean, almost 95, 99% of all companies, of all jobs out there require a college degree to be able to even submit an application. And uh, I definitely don't see that changing over the, at least the near future, maybe who knows, much farther down the road. Uh, but for now, I think uh, it's certainly the, the, the standard that we're, that we're seeing. Uh, it doesn't mean there aren't other opportunities for you, right? It doesn't mean you can't be an entrepreneur, but I think you can also do both at the same time. I think you can go to college and at the same time, build a business for yourself, try to be an entrepreneur. If the entrepreneurship thing takes off, that's great. You know, maybe you can pursue that if you're already making money and you're, uh, um, you know, building something and creating something. But if you're in school and you're trying the entrepreneur game and you find that the entrepreneur stuff you're struggling with, you're not able to make much progress. Hey, you know what? You have that college degree when you graduate and then you can pursue a, a job working for a company that's out there. And that's not a bad thing because we're seeing a lot of companies take employee experience more seriously, creating great places to work, buy pensions, uh, changing the way that they uh, just build organizations. So I think uh, having those full-time jobs, is uh, it's not a bad thing. There are a lot of great companies that are out there. What about going straight for the full-time job, either trying to get a job at a startup or apprenticing with someone like you or another smaller business? You can. I mean, it, it depends on where you are in life. Uh, it, it, it certainly depends on, on life stage, right? I mean, if you're, if you're young and you want to try that apprenticeship, uh, go for it. I think the, you need to pursue multiple paths at the same time. So you can be in college getting the degree while you also start, try to start your own business while at the same time you try to become uh, an apprentice for somebody else and you see which one of those things pick off and take off. Uh, that's kind of the, the important route to go down. So in some ways, when you're in school, before you even get your full-time job, you might even be working harder than, uh, than uh, you will uh, later on. 
right? I mean, a lot of people view college as just kind of partying and, and whatnot. I mean, even me, when I was at UC Santa Cruz, I would be in the library till two, three in the morning, double majoring, studying, working like a dog while people are running around, you know, naked doing God knows what. It's it's personal it's personal attitude and preference and, and how you approach the world. And for me, it was just about, you know, I want to get out of college. I want to do well and I want to get a good job and I want to be successful. And um, that's the route I took. I think there's definitely some fields where it makes sense for college. If it's, if it's STEM, it makes sense. Science, technology, education, math, medicine. But I think there's a lot of people that are going to college because they think they need to go to college and they're getting degrees primarily in liberal arts things that have no relevance in the future or the workforce? You know, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, even a lot of organizations around the world are starting to put more of an emphasis on liberal arts because they believe that it's important to create human organizations. And human organizations are largely driven by liberal arts things, history, sociology, communication, things that don't have a tangible ROI where you're not coding or building something. Uh, so it depends. But, you know, if... Um, you know, you go to uh, any organization out there that look that's looking to hire two people where all things are equal. One person has a degree in philosophy. One person doesn't have a degree. Guess who they're going to hire? The person who has a degree in philosophy, right? That's just, that's just how it is. Uh, unless, you know, unless you've built something that the other person hasn't and it's for a technical degree, unless maybe you have a, you know, a great relationship there, you know, those types of things happen. But the, the practicality of it is that if two, I mean, even for me, right, if I'm going to hire somebody for to do full time work, and I have two people that are looking to apply for a marketing position, one has a college degree and one doesn't, all things that are all other things being equal, guess who I'm bringing on the person with the college degree, because there's something about that college degree where you know, the person worked hard, they built relationships, they had to communicate effectively, they learned certain life skills in college that the other person maybe didn't. Uh, so it's it's different. I mean, that's just college, I think is a good insurance policy. But it doesn't mean it will always be like that. That's just how it is now. Okay. Well, Jacob, I want to thank you for coming on today. I got one last question for you. And that's if you had to leave people with one thing, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything, what would it be and why? Uh, probably take more accountability over building your own future. So don't rely on other people, on companies, on schools to teach you everything you need to need to know to be successful. Uh, take matters into your own hands. Ask yourself, what's the future you want to see happen? And what do you need to do to build it? I think that's pretty solid advice. Where's the best pe place for people to find you and say, hey? Uh, I'm pretty easy to find online. Uh, if you just type in Jacob Morgan into Google, you'll come across a lot of my stuff uh, or my main homepage is thefutureorganization.com. Awesome. Thanks for coming on today, Jacob. And thanks my for pleasure. Me, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cheers.